kidding. I'm going to tell you the truth. We smile and we laugh, but hear me, I mean that. <laughs> All jokes aside, I mean that. The only way you win is if you keep on fighting. study boxing, you'll find out when you look at Mike Tyson, Mike Tyson was the master of the one-punch knockout. Many, many times, they, they, they'd be just fighting, you couldn't even tell which way it would go. He'd wait on that one punch. And if you ever saw him do it, it's, it's like an eight-inch punch from a dead stop to contact. It, it wasn't but eight inches. I've never seen nobody hit that hard in eight inches in my life. One person, and, and though he lost his last fight, all the way to the end, I wasn't convinced. Because you can't tell who's gonna win the fight by who won the round. Tell somebody, say, all I need is one good punch. I dare you to get me if you, ow, ow! Let me behave myself. Uh, time for the word of God. Bibles turn to Gospel of St. John chapter 15. <laughs> See, what you don't understand, honestly, honestly, some of you just rejoice, you have a good time. Some of you just think it's interesting and curious and different. But there are people in this room who are fighting like cancer. There are people in this room fighting leukemia. There are people in this room fighting through divorce. There are people in this room who just left the hospital and ran over here to have service and, and their child is hooked up on respirators and monitors. And when I say, keep on fighting! important job in the world. I got the most important job in the world, preach the gospel. Encourage God's people to keep on fighting the important job. Important job. I, I'd have to step down to be the president. I'd have to give up something more important to run for governor or something like that because God wants to use me to ignite your faith to keep on fighting. See? All you need is one punch. I'm gonna get out of that, I ain't gonna bother that. You can be in debt over your head, they took your car, they're getting ready to evict you out of your house. I'm telling you, all you need is one punch. One thing can go right and turn your whole life completely.
After 50 things going wrong, one thing can go right. It's our custom to stand for the reading of the Word of God. We'd ask you to stand even if you have no Bible. We're going to be in the Gospel of St. John, chapter number 15. It's a privilege to be your pastor and to have an opportunity to share the Word with you. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We have never been inundated with so many letters as we got from the God's Leading Lady Conference. I mean, people literally just letters, emails, cards. <laughs> Postgrams, telegrams, every other kind of gram. Telegram, tell a woman, tell a man. I mean, every, every method of communication is going out. People being greatly blessed uh, from this meeting. We're glad. We're glad about it. It means a whole lot to be a blessing. Whether, whether you know it or not, God will reward you for blessing other people. And he'll, he'll reward you. I want you to go to Gospel of St. John, chapter number 15, beginning at verse number uh, 15. In fact, no, I preached 15 last week. I, I want to preach 16. Yeah. yeah, I'm just going to slide down one verse from where I was last week. I, I preach still friends. You remember that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Henceforth, I call you no longer servants, but I call you friends. For a servant knoweth not what his master doeth. I preach still friends. This week we're going to go a little deeper. We're going to go into the 16th verse. And I want you to read the 16th verse of the 15th chapter of the Gospel of St. John in conflict. If you don't have a Bible, look at somebody else's Bible. And we're going to read together the family of God. And I believe as you read it, just reading it is going to bless you. Much less studying it, just reading it is going to bless you. The 16th verse. Are you ready? Let's go. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Isn't that something wonderful? I can let you go home right now. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever ye ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. I want you to look at the first five words in the 16th verse of the 15th chapter of the Gospel of St. John. The first five words said, Ye have not chosen me. Say it again. Ye have not chosen me. One more time. Ye have not chosen me. That's what I'm going to preach this morning. Ye have not chosen me. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to preach this word. I know that the flower fades and the grass withers, but the word of the Lord shall stand forever. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. Like Job, I esteem it above my necessary food. Like David, Lord, I thank you for your word guiding me when the enemy would come in. Your word protected me from the attacks of the enemy. Like the centurion, I stand in the middle of the road and say, speak the word only and my servant shall live. Like John, I recognize that the word is made flesh and dwelt among us and we behold the wonder of his glory. Speak that word in this place today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Hi, y'all. Ye have not chosen me. I, 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 I last week labored to exegete several passages out of the 15th chapter of the Gospel of St. John discussing with you the relationship that we have with God that is predicated upon a, a long-term relationship of friendship moving from servitude to friendship. And, and somewhere in the middle of the message, I pointed out the, the multiplicity of times that God keeps saying to us in the middle of being cut back and pruned, as it were, because it is not a relationship of mountaintops. There are some valleys. There are some low places. In the middle of all of that, he keeps saying to us, abide, abide, abide. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch abides in the vine, so ought ye to abide in me. If ye abide in me and my word abide in you, you shall ask what you will. 
and it shall be done unto you. Why is he telling us to abide? He's telling us to abide because life gets tough. Life gets tough. I, I have a problem with two extremes. On one extreme, there are some people that teach you that if you walk with God, you won't go through anything. You, you, won't, you won't get sick. You won't ever be broke. You won't have any marital problems. All of your kids will graduate from college on the dean's list without any challenges or all of that. They make it sound like heaven. And they make it sound like if you don't drive around in a Porsche or Bentley and a Rolls Royce, you don't have faith in God. And on the other extreme, and I, I don't agree with that because I really believe your faith is proven in your affliction. I believe, I believe my faith was proven by how I went through the struggle. A a amen. I, I didn't need faith once I got it. I needed faith when I didn't have anything to preach God was able and, and didn't have anything. To preach God was a provider and they were taking my car out, out of the driveway. To preach that God was a healer and have a sickness in your body. That's when faith is needed. That's, that's the root of faith is planted in the extremities of life. The fruit of faith is experienced when you come out on the other side. And I'm concerned that we get people excited about the fruit and don't have the seed of faith down in them. Then we just start to only serve God for the things that he gives us rather than for who he is. And so while I believe in prosperity, I believe in healing, I believe in all of that, I think it's also important that we don't serve God for the things that he does, but we serve him for who he is. And that we don't use the experience of our faith to belittle other people who are just like us, only at a different stage in the process. In other words, just because you graduated, don't burn down the school. <laughs> don't burn down the school now that you completed your courses and look down your nose at me. I'm where you were last year. <laughs> and the same God that brought you through will bring me through. Does that make sense to you? On the other extreme of people who, who justify their faith by, by the amount of investments and mutual funds they have, that, that might not be good right now. <laughs> Hallelujah. But the other extreme of people who, who think that God gets glory out of them being sick, broke, defeated, depressed, and they don't want to be delivered. They just say, you know, God is getting the glory out of this. And they love to talk about what the enemy did to them and how beat up they were and how they felt like dying and they're so negative. And, 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 and generally when you go to either extremes, you don't get truth. Truth is in the middle. Truth has been being a balanced person, not going to either extreme, balancing yourself. To be balanced is to be mature. Are you following what I'm saying? Jesus takes him through a series of exercises whereby in the early parts of this chapter, he causes him to understand, I want you to bring forth fruit, more fruit, and much fruit, but in between each stage, I want you to understand there will be some prunings, there will be some low places, and what I need you to do is abide in me through the struggles of life, to, to hang in there, not to give up, not to collapse, and to know that I'm going to bring you out. Are you following me? In the middle of this process is wonderful discourse. The first 10 or so, 10, 12 verses of this chapter, just wonderful preaching material. You could be in it for months and months and months. All of a sudden, in the middle of everything, it seems to have nothing to do with anything. He, he seems to change subjects and say, ye have not chosen me. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. I want to share with you why he said ye have not chosen me. It is very important who chose who. Now, I know that those of you that are Christians, you think that you chose the Lord. And some of that is reinforced by the songs we sing. Like, like I grew up singing, I decided to make Jesus my choice. I decided to make Jesus. You have to throw your hip in it, it don't work. My choice, you know, some folks, you know. And we go through all that, and it's wonderful, it's wonderful. Keep on singing, you ain't gotta change. It's not right, but it's wonderful. It's a wonderful song. We used to get a happy and cry over it and everything gets saved over, but it's wrong. The reason, the reason it's technically wrong is it, it's not really that you decided to make it. It wasn't something that you did. Somebody said, ye have not chosen me. That's what Jesus said. He said, ye have not chosen me. It wasn't like you said, I'm decided, you know what? I think I just say. He said, that's not how it happened. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. It does make a difference how the relationship starts. I teach people, I teach ministers as a rule in the 26 years, soon to be 26 years of my ministry, this is coming September, it'll be 26 years I've been preaching the gospel. I have yet to have ever asked anybody to let me preach in 26 years, ever, ever, in any circumstance, ever. I've never gone into a city ever and said, you know, Doc, I'm in town, man, and uh, I got a word for your people. Because God knows where I am. If he chooses to use me in that city, he'll use me in that city. If God doesn't open the door, I will never go in there and, and jimmy the lock and break in someplace. 
it's unethical, it's unspiritual, and to me it's unholy. If God wants to use me in that city, he'll, he'll put me on somebody's mind, he'll open up the door, he'll make the way. I refuse to open up doors for myself. And then secondly, the reason I don't do it is when you invite yourself in, you open yourself up to anything. When people invite you, they, they, they handle you differently because they initiated the relationship. They have a responsibility. And, and when you invite me and I have a right to expect certain things from you, because I will whip out the letter and say, excuse me, but didn't you invite me? And, and with the invitation comes a responsibility that I have a right to expect certain things because you initiated this relationship. I don't like to, I'm careful about whose house I eat at. I mean, I'm not just talking about the issue of the clean food and all of that. I don't like to be in anybody's house where I don't feel welcome. I would rather be welcome in a hut than to be mistreated in a mansion. Now, that's just me. Now, maybe you don't have it like that, but that, that is just my personal preference. I like to know when I sit down at the table that I'm really welcome, that, that, that you welcome me and that you're glad for me to be there. And so I would rather wait on you to invite me than for me to break in and risk you acting funny. I'd, 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 just, I'd rather go hungry. I'd rather chew my fingernails. I'd rather lick my toes than that I'm telling you that God's heaven truth. Look at somebody and say, he mean that thing. <laughs> yeah, then th to risk going in your house because when, when I know that you have chosen me, with that comes a certain expectation rather than me being the initiator. Certain responsibility. If you've ever been in a relationship where you, you cared about somebody and they didn't care about you, it's a very awkward situation. There's a certain assurance that comes when you know that the person that you're involved with cares about you and, and that they have chosen you and you're not spending the rest of your life campaigning trying to get elected into a love situation. You don't have to keep proving yourself every week and, and, and they keep throwing Helen up to you. You know, you know, you know my, my former wife could cook. You know, she could cook. Helen wore a size seven. You know, and there you are, Mabel. You just own all kind of weight loss program trying to be Helen. <laughs> you want to be you. You want somebody who appreciates you. You want somebody who has selected you. You want somebody who has chosen you. Jesus says, in the middle of the changing and the vicissitudes of life, understand that you didn't start the thing. In fact, he says, ye have not chosen me. He says, I have chosen you. Somebody say, I'm chosen. This is an anchor for my soul. It gives me an assurance. It gives me some security. I'm not talking about security as it relates to a doctrine because anytime we make a doctrine out of revelation, it often ends up being a heresy because we carry it to extremes. But I'm talking about the revelation of understanding that the opposite of being a secure believer is being an insecure believer. And if you understand anything about relationships, relationships don't do well when you're insecure. Now, you know, some of y'all want to shout off of that, but you know... You don't want people to know what you're dealing with right along in here. It, it doesn't feel good when you're insecure. You need to know that there is a stable place where you can rest and where you don't have to perform. And so Jesus goes out of his way to tell his disciples, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. You have been selected. I picked you. I wanted you and not anybody else. The speaker was getting ready to speak for us not too long ago, and I knew the speaker was nervous. And I said uh, to the speaker, I said, uh, listen, I said, the thing you've got to always remember is that we invited you. Amen. That's a wonderful, liberating thing. Amen. That means that all the speakers, the, 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 the Copelands and the Hagans and the Prices and the T.D. Jakes and the Benny Hens or whoever, Billy Graham, whoever it is you want to call, that, that, that we didn't call them, we called you. So make sure you show up. Glory. Don't show up acting like somebody that we could have invited and didn't. Glory. You understand what I'm saying? We, we already knew who you were. As a rule, I don't invite people that I've never heard. So we already knew who you were. We already know how you minister. We already selected you. So you can walk to the podium with all confidence that what we asked for, we got. And if, if, if we didn't want that, we wouldn't call you. This is the assurance that comes from knowing who chose who. Let me try to bring the point in this way. Several years ago, many years ago, 
uh, my ministry took a turn. It, it, it went from obscurity. Uh, it, it, I, I would even say poverty, though I'm not talking about finances. I'm talking about po impoverished from the standpoint of obscurity. Seldom used, you know, seldom called on. Just and it, it generally called on in a, in a rural way, in, in the backwoods, preaching in the hills and so forth and so on. And I don't want you to think that it was a bad time because it, it wasn't a bad time because it was the only time I'd ever had. So a bad time in the bad time when you don't have a point of reference, it's just all you ever know. It's like being poor. If you've always been poor, you don't know you're poor. Because you're poor and all your friends are poor and so poor looks normal because it's... You have to get out of it and look back and say, you know what? We were poor. I realized in retrospect, I grew up poor. I didn't know it at the time, but I realized that, 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 that I had to go to school to find out what spaghetti sauce was because when mama made spaghetti, she put ketchup on it. I didn't know something else was supposed to go on the sandwich other than tomatoes. So I ate a tomato sandwich. I thought that was the completion of the sandwich. If you give one of my kids a tomato sandwich, they will think you are on crack. They will do that commercial, where's the beef? So I was in obscurity, I didn't know the difference, it was fine, it was the way things were, and all of a sudden God started to open up doors and, and the crowds kept getting bigger and the ministry kept getting bigger and, and he started to open doors and taking me around the country and around the world and all of a sudden I was on national TV and everybody was glad, my church was excited, my family was excited, they, they was high-fiving each other and everything like that. And I acted like I was glad around them, but I came home one day by myself. I came in the house by myself, nobody was in the house but me, and I laid across the bed and burst into tears. I burst into tears. I don't do that often. I'm not, I'm not somebody you run home crying easy, so don't think that. Uh, just in case you're out there, don't think that. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I burst into tears. I, I, I called my spiritual father. I called him on the phone. It's wonderful to have this kind of relationship. I called him on the phone. I couldn't even talk. He answered the phone and said, hello. I didn't even say anything. I couldn't talk. I was that upset. I, I didn't want to start crying on the phone, so I didn't say anything. And it, it, it silence for a few minutes. He discerned who it was, A. B, he discerned what was wrong. <laughs> That's good. And he said, uh, he said, it just hit you, didn't it? I said, mm -hmm. <laughs> He said, it just hit you. I said, yes, sir. It did just hit me. It just hit me how God had opened up doors, how much he had blessed, how intimidating it was, uh, how terrified I was of the level of blessing and the things that God had done in my life. It blew my mind. I wasn't prepared for it. It was overwhelming. Everybody else was glad about it, but I wasn't sure that I could handle that kind of light, that kind of heat, that kind of responsibility. Because when people put you on the stage, they have so many expectations from you. And it was intimidating. It was horrifying. Sometimes blessings are horrifying. Don't you think that every blessing is something you rejoice in? Most of the time, the blessing is so overwhelming. When God pours it, I just think, oh, no, not me. You have got to be kidding. And he said something to me I will never forget as long as I live. He said, I understand how you feel. He said, but you've got you to understand one thing. If you would have started it yourself, you would have to finish it yourself. But since you didn't start it, It's not like you were running around passing out business cards and say, try me, try me, try me, try me. Since you were just back there saying, Lord, I'm available to you, and God just opened up the door and chose to start it. Whatever God starts, God will finish. He's Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And what Jesus wanted his disciples to know, ye have not chosen me. So no matter whether you're on the mountain or in the valley, whether you're going through a pruning process or whether you're flourishing, just always remember that I'm going to take you through all of these stages and I'm going to bring you through it because you didn't start this. You don't have to finish it. Ye have not chosen me. Look at somebody and say, I'm chosen. I'm chosen. I'm chosen. To be chosen. To be preferred. To be preferred. To be chosen, to be preferred. See, see, it, it's like when, when the Bible talks about the relationship that we have with God, uh, it, it, it uses terms like adoption. It uses terms like adoption. It, it, it uses terms like adoption for a reason. Uh, get your Bible. There's a couple of things I want to show you right quick. Get your Bible. Don't, don't put your Bible away. Go to Galatians 4.4. 4. 
you see it? Galatians 4 4. You got 30 seconds to find it. 29, 28, 27, 26, 25, 24, 23, 22, 21, 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10 seconds left. 10, 9, 8. Oh God, I can't find it. I can't find it. Don't turn the page. Don't turn the page. 8, 7, 6, 7. It's a horrifying thing when you can't find it. And a book like Galatians will mess you up, mug, if you don't know your books. It ain't that big. Praise God. Galatians 4 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that, he, that we might receive the what? The adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. He, he, he said he adopted you in verse 5. He adopted you in verse 5. In verse 6, it says, ye are sons. And at the end of verse 6, it says, now the spirit causes you to cry out, Abba, Father. It means you start speaking out what you are. Oh, God. You worry it before you start speaking out what you were. And, he, and, he, and it's all predicated not on birth, on adoption. Adoption. Somebody say adoption. See, it is possible to have a baby, to birth a baby, and not want to. I love it when you sisters act phony. As many of y'all that got pregnant and sat up and cried all day, and said, oh, Lord, it's the wrong time. Oh, God, not now. Henry ain't even been here for two weeks. It's possible to be pregnant and, and not want to be. And you have to adjust it. You have to accommodate it. You have to move things around. But nobody ever adopts by accident. When the Bible uses terms like adoption, it wants you to know that God, as a sovereign act of his will, selected you. He looked over and said, you know, that one. That one. Third row, fifth one back. That one. Fifth one on the balcony, seventh one in, that one. Chosen you, selected you. He knew who you were when he chose you. He knew everything about you when he chose you. He knew every weakness, every mistake, every struggle, every inability. You know, Lord, I don't see too good. He knows that. You know, Lord, I stuck, I talk with a stutter. He knows that. You know, Lord, I don't I don't feel secure. He knew, he knew all of that when he chose you. And yet he chose you anyway because God had a plan for your life and he wanted to use you in a special way. You are not an accident, you're not an incident, you're not something that God just adjusted to. He preferred you, he selected you, he picked you. He picked you, he picked you, he handpicked you, he selected you, he elected you, he picked you out. It could have been anybody, he chose you. Good God, do you understand what a grace you walk in, what a power you walk in. You're chosen. Somebody shout out, chosen. I'm chosen. I'm chosen. I'm selected. I never have to come into God's presence and wonder if it's okay for me to be there. Because he chose me. He, he chose me. Anytime I do it myself, I have to go in and wonder, will I get in? Will it be all right? Do you want to see me? Are you prepared for company? Do you want me to sit down at the table? Should I eat? Should I not eat? But when you invited me, I assume you're ready for me. You got a seat for me. You got enough food for me. You're ready to receive me. God wouldn't have chose you if he wasn't prepared to fix you up, to strengthen you, to equip you, to prepare you and release you. And whatever life is taking you through, walk into it and say, he's chosen me. Depending on your gender, whether you're a man or a woman, touch somebody and tell them, I'm the man for the job. So we, we, we have understood clearly what it is to be chosen, to be selected, to be preferred, to be chosen. It, it makes a difference when you're chosen. You're handled different when you're chosen. There are certain, when you fly with American Airlines all the time, it comes to a point when they type your name into the computer, it comes right up on the screen that you are a preferred client. They handle you differently. 
they'll upgrade you automatically. They'll give you preferential treatment. You don't have to wait in lines like other people wait in line because you have reached that status of preferred treatment. If you got a black executive level American Express card, when you whip it down, it lets the sales clerk know he bad. They start saying, yes, sir. Would you like anything else, sir? Oh, let me show you this, sir. We'd be glad to ship that back for you, sir. Anything you need, sir, because the black AE says you are bad. <laughs> means you've been chosen, you've been selected. Before, when I used to want credit cards, I used to go down to the window. <laughs> My dream in life was to have a serious revolving credit card. Because then as soon as you could get, you could get something to eat, you could get your tires fixed, you could get some gas if you were in trouble. If I could ever get a Sears revolving credit card. And when I would fill out the application, it wouldn't say decline, it'd say don't even think about it. <laughs> get it out of your mind. We're not thinking about you. Cash only, forget it. Now they send me credit cards I didn't even ask for. They send me credit cards in case you ever need a credit card. <laughs> Whew, chosen. chosen. You have been selected for this credit card. They send you all kinds of letters. You are preferred. You don't even have to apply. Just sign it. It's coming automatic. Call our number. We are activated. All kind of stuff because you are chosen. If you can understand that about American Express, you can understand that about Visa, MasterCard, Sears, and Bob and Charles, you can have, why can't you understand that about God? He said, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. It means you walk in a room, I see you. If you cry unto me, I hear you. If you look to me, I hear your thoughts. I know your face, I know your needs. It means I'll expedite your service. I'll take you through things quicker than other people went through it because you are chosen. Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? You didn't make it because you were smart. You didn't make it because you were slick. You didn't make it because you were tough. You made it because you were chosen. God snatched you out of stuff. He delivered you from stuff. He pulled you out. Get a clue, baby. Haven't you ever wondered why you survived stuff that killed other people? Other people lost their mind some kind of way you made it. You made dumb decisions, did stupid stuff, and still some kind of way God blessed you. You could have been dead, could have been in jail, could have lost your mind. You've been mad enough at people to kill them. You could have been a murderer, but some kind of way God just kept pulling you out of stuff and pulling you out of stuff, pulling you out of stuff. You are chosen, baby. chosen we understand that we are chosen I want to talk to you a little bit about when we're chosen because if you don't understand when you're chosen you won't understand the power of this cho cho of being chosen of being selected you have to know when you're chosen because see some people think that uh, you came to the altar and God chose you and s some people think that when you finish your degree, God chose you. And some people think because you can sing, God chose you. And because he needed a speaker and you, you got a good voice, God took an application on you and he chose you. And some people think they've been chosen because they are just so fine. They're just so fine and they look good on TV. You ever seen these jokes on TV who think they're there because they're pretty and they're all in the camera. They came peace go. <laughs> now we're going to have a word for our senses. God's got people more educated, more intellectual, more talented, more attractive, everything else than you. He didn't choose you on the basis of something that he gave you. Whatever you know, he lets you know it. Whatever you look like, you didn't have nothing to do with that. 
Whatever you were able to, 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 to digest as it relates to information and education, it's only because God gave you the wherewithal to do it. Whatever you've accomplished in life, it's just something that God gave you. If you can sing, guess who gave you your voice? If you can speak, guess who gave you the ability to do that? If you can manage well, guess who gave you that creativity? God wasn't hard up for you. Let me show you something. Go to, go to the book of Jeremiah. I'm going to show you something. Go to the book of Jeremiah. Uh, wait a minute. Wait. Don't go to Jeremiah. Go to Ephesians. Go to Ephesians. Fish you right by it. Just skip over from Galatians. Go to Ephesians for one moment. Next chapter over. Next book over. Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 4. I do this because I want you to learn your Bible. Amen. Ephesians 1 verse 4. You see it? It starts out according. It says, according as he hath chosen us in him, when? Before the foundations of the world. He chose us before the foundations of the world. He chose us before we got saved then. He chose us before we got right then. That means he chose us before we were born. That means he chose us in eternity before the foundations of the world. What? That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That means it wasn't nothing that I did that make him choose me. I didn't have to convince him to choose me. I didn't have to work so that he could choose. He chose me before I was aware of myself, before I was conscious, before, before the doctor slapped me on the bottom and I came out crying, before my grandmama met my granddaddy and they went for a buggy ride on a wooden pickup. He chose me in him before the foundations of the world. I came here chosen. No wonder I couldn't lay where other people laid or stay where other people stayed or rest where other people rested. Even when I tried to do it, he wouldn't let me stay there. I'm not saying I didn't get into it. I'm saying I couldn't stay. Have you ever noticed that other people were able to rest in stuff that you couldn't rest in? Even things that you liked. But because you were chosen, you, you, you leave, when you are chosen, you'll leave stuff you like. And so I don't know why I'm breaking up with you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I have experienced in my life that I will always love you, but it's just something. I don't know what it is. I know it's crazy. I may hate myself in the morning, but give me my beeper back and give me my phone back here. Tell somebody, tell them I'm chosen. Go to Jeremiah. I want to show you one more thing. I'll be out of your way in just a minute. My God, my God, my God, my God. Is this helping anybody? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You wipe out her. Glory to God. Thank you. May God bless you. Heaven smile on you. Thank you, Jesus. Jeremiah 1. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 4. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 4. You got it? I'm going to say it again because somebody's still looking for it. That's all right. Keep on looking. Keep on looking. Don't panic. Don't panic. Don't hide the Bible. Don't act like you found it. That's what you do when you get up under stress. People do lie in church. They'll be reading out of Habakkuk. <laughs> They will lie in a minute. I mean, preachers today, everybody can't find the book. Just, uh, uh, oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's why we need the blood. If it wasn't for the blood, heaven would be empty. Heaven would be a ghost town. It'd be worse than Little House on the Prairie. Tumbleweed would be rolling all down the golden streets. Thank God for Jesus. <laughs> Jeremiah 1 verse 4, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee 
in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee to be a prophet unto the nation. Somebody holler before. before. You were chosen in him before the foundations of the world, before you ever formed in your mother's belly, before she ever got morning sickness. God had already chosen you. That's why you survived. That's why you endured. That's why you keep coming back. Some of you have had nine lives. You worse than a cat. You just keep coming back. Every time the devil thinks he has you, you snap back out of it again because some kind of way the Lord has brought you through. Don't be afraid of it. Tell somebody, say, I'm chosen. See, if you don't know it, you can't operate in it. If you don't understand it, you can't realize it. And if you think you're just chosen because you're a good prayer warrior, when you stop praying, you'll feel like you're not chosen. If you think you're just chosen because you know Greek and Hebrew and you study your Bible all the time, when you have a week of let up, the devil will come in and say you lost it. But if you say, wait a minute, devil, whether I studied or didn't study, whether I'm up or down, whether I'm together or not together, before I was formed in my mama's belly, he chose me. He selected me. I can go to God when I can't go to anybody else. That's what the prodigal son knew about his father. He said, I got mud on me and I smell like slop and I've been laying with the hogs, but in my father's house, there's bread enough in despair. I will arise. He's still my daddy and go to my father. Ooh, God, do you hear what I'm saying? Tell somebody, say, you're chosen. You can't live like the other people live. You can't do what they do. You can't rest like they rest. They do that because they have no option. But you, you're, you're chosen. He picked you out. He snatched you up. He gave you favor. He put running in your feet. God chose you. way you always survived the times you almost drowned and didn't the times you climbed out of car wrecks when other folks couldn't the times you made it through the hospital where other folks died the, the near calamities diseases I, I wish you would think back on the friends you know who OD'd the, the friends you know who died of AIDS. I, I wish you would think back on the near mishaps. People who you thought were friends and found out were enemies. They were trying to kill you and destroy you. Haven't you ever wondered how you survived? Sometimes you were in trouble. You didn't even know you were in trouble. You were with the wrong crowd. You didn't even know they were the wrong crowd. You thought they were your friends. They were your enemies. But some kind of way, God protected you. Haven't you wondered why? Haven't you ever thought up at night and said, isn't this kind of crazy that I'm still here through hell and high water, trials and temptations? I made it. Sometimes I messed up and made it. I was wrong and made it. I was weak and made it. I was hormonal and made it. I was all y'all are here. If it had not been for the Lord. Oh, 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 amazing, amazing. It's amazing. I'm chosen. Tell somebody and tell them I'm chosen. That doesn't mean that I can live anyway do just any kind of thing, take God's grace for granted. Romans 6 and 1 says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How can we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? But it does mean that God wants me to have some comfort and some assurance and some peace about his attitude toward me. That in the midst of me trying to figure out, is he really my friend? Is she really my friend? Can I really do business with him? Can I trust him or not? Why is she in my life? Why did he call me? And all the people you are unsure of, God ain't got to be one of them. <laughs> 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 
ye have not chosen me. I chose you. I knew you and I chose you anyway. I knew every weak, wayward, peculiar habit you had and I chose you anyway. I knew I was enough God to pull you out of your weakness. I chose you. I chose you before you messed up, knew you was gonna mess up, knew I was God enough to straighten you out. I not only chose you, I chose your test. I chose your struggle. I chose your temptation. I knew what to take you through to get your attention. I knew how to make you pray. I knew how to bring you to your knee. I knew how to humble you when you got too puffed up. I knew who to take you through tests with so you'd find out it wasn't them that bless you and it wasn't them that bless you. She walked off and left you. I meant for her to leave you so you could see you could make it without her. I meant for him to leave you so I could show you as long as I'm on your side, you don't have to hell y'all, 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 hear what I'm saying? Ye have not chosen me. My God, my God. He says, I have chosen you and I have ordained you, ordained, 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 speaks to the future, ordained, ordinance, a mandate, order. I ordered your steps, I predetermined your path. I set you apart. I ordained you. I wouldn't let life kill you because I ordained you. And when life said kill, ordination said no. <laughs> when justice said attack, ordination said no. It's not written. It's written that she shall overcome. It's written that he'll come out of it. It's written that they'll survive. I ordained you. Sometimes I had to bring you weak. You were weak. You didn't even have the strength to fight. When you lost your fight, I carried you. When you lost lost your drive, I pushed you. When you lost your way, I found you. When you got tied up in sin, I loose you. I ordained. I wish there was somebody who knew what I was talking about today. Order! The steps of a good man ordered by the Lord. Good God, I feel like praising. Order my steps in your word, dear Lord. Order my way. Order which way, which way to go. Who can I trust? Where can I go? Who can I lean on? The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. That's why no weapon formed against you shall be able. chosen me but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit you were chosen to be fruitful you were chosen to be blessed get that through your thick head you were chosen to be blessed if you ever get that through your head it'll change your world forever you were chosen to be blessed stop trying to be blessed and just be it just, just be it. Just, 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 just be it until it becomes your natural environment. Till it ceases to be unusual. You were chosen to be an overcomer. You were chosen to have preferential treatment. You're supposed to. God meant to spoil you. It's the Father's good pleasure to spoil you. See, see, I don't struggle. I don't struggle. I don't struggle with this. I don't struggle with this issue. I have issues, but this is not one of them. I don't struggle with this issue because I'm the baby of my family. I was well nurtured. I was well liked. I got lots of attention all of my life. There was no question I was the baby of the family. I will always be irrevocably, immutably, and unchangeably. With gray hair and bald head, I am still the baby of the family. I always got some need. I could come in at two o'clock in the morning and get a full course meal because I was my mother's baby. <laughs> Don't mean maybe cook for me in the middle of the night. 
because I got it like that. <laughs> my brother would fight you right now over me because I was the baby. My sister would scratch your eyes out because I was the baby of the family. I could be wrong and she would still hit you over me because I was the baby. So when I got saved and God said he favored me, that was easy for me to believe because my mind was accustomed to understanding who I was. Some of you, you got to do a makeover because you've been mistreated all of your life, but you got to get this word in your head. You are chosen of the Lord. Your bad times are over. God is ready to bless you. He has ordained you that you might have good success. The very first thing God said to man when he made him was be fruitful. God said, oh, I ordain you that you should bring forth fruit. God, help me with this. If I could get through this in Dallas, this ministry would explode. Some people say it's already exploded, but there's another level. If I could, if I could, if, 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 I, if, if I could get you to just understand that you are chosen to be fruitful, that you are supposed to be blessed. If I could get you out of this defeated mentality, this pole, pitiful, broke down, weak came, weak came, weak, if we could ever break them crutches so you could start walking in the integrity of who God said you were, if you could ever get your head up and your back straight and quit saying yes sir boss to life and stand up. have not seen your ears have not heard neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has in store for them that love him you're supposed to be blessed oh y'all can't handle this you're supposed to eat in the finest restaurant you're so why should the only people that go to the places be the atheists and the agnostic and people worshiping the stars and the moon? There ought to be some blood washed, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, tongue talking folk sitting up there talking about, uh, this is why. I'll take this is why. Indeed, a re baby, get used to it. Tell all of your enemies, get used to it. Tell them I'm God's baby. He'll answer my prayer in the middle of the night. If he's gonna bless anybody, he's gonna bless me. He'll step over folk to get me. I'm chosen. I didn't just wander in the kingdom. I wasn't a mistake. God selected me. Oh, I feel something about to break up in here today. When it breaks up in here, your spirit is going to another level. Watch somebody say, be fruitful. Be fruitful. Bring forth fruit in your marriage, in your finances, in your life, in your business, in your spirit, in your heart. Stop being depressed and be fruitful. Stop being defeated and be fruitful. Stop being hateful and be fruitful. Stop being frustrated and be fruitful. I want you to testify somebody. Take them by the hand right now and say, neighbor, I just want to tell you something. There's a reason I'm in church this morning. God wanted me to hear this message. Something is about to break loose in my life.
just three people and tell them I'm chosen. I'm going to say it loud, I'm chosen. Hello, I'm chosen. Good morning, I'm chosen. How are you? I'm chosen. 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 I am chosen. I am chosen. Blood wash, sanctified, Holy Ghost fear. Chosen in the Lord. Chosen to prosper. Chosen to provide. Chosen to overcome. and not know you're chosen. Have you ever had anybody fall in love with you and you didn't know it? Come on, let's be real. Nobody here but you and I. Let's be real. Come on. You, you, you weren't affected by it because you didn't know it. Even though they loved you, they had all them feelings for you, you weren't affected by it because you didn't know it. It only affects you when you know it. And that's the way truth is. God says, I've got all of this for you, but if you don't know it, you won't walk like it. You'll have your head down. You'll be feeling sorry for yourself. You'll be singing, nobody knows the trouble I see. All you need is a word from God. The word will tell you, I'm chosen in him before the foundations of, oh, good God, have mercy. Daniel 11:32 said, "The people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. The people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. If you don't know it, you can't do it. Say that with me. If you don't know it, you can't do it. Say it again. Say it again. If you ever get that in your spirit, that's why it does matter where you go to church. It does matter who teaches you the word of God. I didn't come to get three points in a poem. I can read my own poem. I need a word from God that quickens my spirit, renews my mind, rejuvenates my spirit, gets me ready to fight the good fight of faith. Go in the enemy's camp and take back what he stole from me. Two more things, sit down, sit down. Two more things, I'll be finished. The other significant point in this text, he says, I have, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. That's important. Because when God begins to bless you, there is a fear that it won't last. Because you've been pruned in the past and you've been cut back in the past and you've been challenged in the past, you can't relax in it. It's like, it's like having a, a recline or lazy boy chair, but you're afraid to lay back in it. And some of you, God has really blessed you, but you, you're not relaxing in the blessing. You, you, you're braced for, for failure. You're used to attack. You're used to being rejected. And even though it's better times, you're still stressed out. And you're tired in the morning. You're tired when you go to bed at night. And you don't understand how you could have paid all that money for that wonderful mattress and still can't sleep on it. It's because you're afraid somebody's about to carry it up out of this mug. But if you ever just start resting in the breast of the Lord and say, he didn't bring me this far to lose me. If he was going to kill me, he could have killed me a long time ago. If God hated me, I could have been dead. He he didn't have to wait to this stage in my life. I ordain you that you should go and that you should bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. That your fruit should remain. That your fruit should remain. Fruit should remain. It's amazing how we preach about the struggle and we don't preach about the, the sustained success of God. We, we talk about Job's struggle, which was just a few months out of his whole life. Everything that happened to Job negatively was just a brief, brief excerpt in the totality of his whole life. We talk about Joseph being in the pit and being in the prison, being in Potiphar's house. When in reality, when God brought Joseph up out of the prison, he continued in success all of his life till he died. He died in prosperity and blessing. And when he died, he said, don't even bury me in this stuff. Carry my bones into the promised land. He lived the rest of his life in victory and it was sustained. 
Hebrews 1 and 3 says he upholds all things. Talking about God. He upholds all things by the word of his power. It means that God wouldn't speak something over your life and then let it fall. He said, he said his word in Isaiah, he said his word would not return unto him void, but it would do that thing whereunto it had been sent. So when God said, let there be light, he didn't just say, let there be light and then let the sun fall down. Have you noticed that the sun is still spinning right where God spoke it? Because the same word that spoke it sustained it. The same word that spoke it sustained it. The same word that spoke it sustained it. And if God sustained the sun and it's not even a living thing, how much more would God sustain you if you start walking in the integrity of what God has promised you? You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. I want to pray this prayer with you. Bow your heads and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I haven't rested in your promises like I should. I admit that when good times came, I was afraid of them. When good people came, I was afraid to trust them. When prosperity came, I was afraid it wouldn't last. Thank you for the word you gave me today. Because now I know I have a right to believe that my fruit will remain. Give God a praise if you need. Finally, he says, and Somebody say and. and, which means in addition to, whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. I'm going to tell you this and I'm going to close. Where are the men in the house? Let me hear the men. Let me tell you something, sisters. Let me tell you something, sisters. When a man goes out and buys you something, when he goes out and buys you something, I'm going to tell you the real deal. I'm going to tell you, we only do it for one reason, period. Period. It is for the reaction. It is for the only reason that big, ugly joker goes up in Victoria's Secrets. <clears throat> trying to pick out something for which he does not even know what size you wear, what color or exactly how you put the thing on. It's for the reaction. The only reason you take on another car payment and bring her home the car and put the big bow on the joker in the driveway is for the reaction. And women who do not react properly Come on, fellas, am I telling the truth up in this world? You want the woman to react. You want her to laugh. You want her to cry. You want her to scream. You want her to fall out on you. You want her to cancel appointments, get a babysitter. Come on, where the men at? And when the woman doesn't react, when she acts like she's too busy to notice, it discourages you from wanting to go through all of that again, because I can't wear this thing no way. God, when a woman knows how to react, it encourages you to do more and more and more because she is appreciative 
because she is appreciative and she's responsive and she gets on the phone and tells everybody about it and brag and she calls her mom and them and tells how wonderful you are and you're just sitting up there smiling and she be talking, oh baby, I just can't get over it. Oh, look at this, oh baby, oh, oh, oh. And you be thinking, now let me see now, when's her birthday coming? When God blesses his people, he wants a reaction. He wants... Y'all got me stirred up. See, see, David, King David wasn't worth two cents. He was weak as water. He had all kind of issues. There were all kind of problems in his life. David had one thing going for him. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Praise ye the Lord. Praise him in the sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him on the psaltery in the heart. Praise him on the cymbals and in the dance. Let everything that have breath, praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Make mention that he's worthy to be praised. His name shall be praised. He shall be exalted amongst the heathen. David kept on saying, God, I thank you. I could have been out there handling the sheep, but you brought me from a mighty long way. And God said, forget Saul. He said, I found a man that's after my heart. I found a man that appreciates me. I found somebody that is thankful for what I've done in my life. I found somebody that's grateful to be chosen. So what you gonna do? What you gonna do? You gonna stand there with your teeth in your mouth looking at me? Or you gonna give God some praise and some glory? to your feet and bow your heads for just a moment. One of the greatest things you can ever do with closed eyes and bowed heads, take a moment and reflect. Reflect. Over your life. See if anything that I preach resonates with you. Are you chosen or not? One Tuesday night in a little sanctified church on the corner of Third and Stockton, sitting on the back row of the church, I was friendly with God, but I didn't have a relationship with him. I had good thoughts toward him, and I was raised to have a respect for him, but I didn't really know him. I belonged to a church. Yeah, I was raised to belong to a church. I grew up in a church. I can't ever remember when I didn't technically belong to somebody's church but I didn't have a real relationship with the Lord and one of the things that made me know that I didn't was watching just a few people out of the midst of all the crazy people in church that really did have a relationship 
I wished I could be that happy. I've been real drunk and not been happy. I've been real drunk and not been happy. I've laughed with people and had no joy. I've been high and had to be careful what I thought about because it would be such a downer, it'd blow my high. I've been in a club that made everybody laugh but me. I knew something was missing out of my life. And there were a whole lot of things in sin that I liked and my flesh enjoyed, but they didn't satisfy. And it's amazing how you can do what you like and not like what you do. In the back of my mind, at my lowest moments, I've always known that I was chosen. That I was supposed to do something with my life. And there's somebody in this room right now, you, you're not right with God, you're not in relationship, you may be a backslider, you may have never really made a commitment to Christ. Or you may be like I was, I call myself a church sinner. I was, you know, I go to church sometime, but I just watched them. I tried to pray a little bit, but I didn't really, I wasn't really hooked up, but I, I went to church, and I, I respected God. That Tuesday night, suddenly I recognized that I would never be who my friends were. Because there was a mark on my life that I could do what they did and I still wasn't them. I could not be them. I couldn't be them. After everything I changed to fit in, I changed my hairstyle, I changed my clothes, I, I, I walked the way they walked, I leaned over in my seat, I tried to be cool daddy, pimp daddy, every other kind of daddy. I just didn't fit. I came to Jesus. I needed desperately to find out what this thing is that keeps pulling me out of stuff I like and, and won't let me rest in things that I wanted to rest in. Why, why am I like this? It was because I was chosen. This Sunday morning, somebody that God has chosen before the foundations of the world, this Sunday morning is going to come to this altar. They're not coming to be chosen. They're coming because they are chosen. They're tired of running from God. And they're saying, Lord, I'm coming home where I fit, where I belong. I used to stay away from church because I thought my weaknesses were strong enough to keep me away from him. But I found out my strengths were stronger than my weaknesses. It was better to be a weak son than to be a strong sinner. <laughs> oh God, God, I'm preaching so good I have to shout myself. And while everybody in this room is praying, I want to fleece this church for sons and daughters, backsliders, sinners, who recognize sin here. It's, it's not so much that you chose to come to church and get saved today, but God has chosen you and he meant for you to hear this message. This message is touching you in places where you've been needing to be touched for a long time and something in you is yearning to make things right with God. I want you to come and stand right at this altar with me and say, Bishop, I want to be saved. I don't want you to hesitate. I don't want you to wrestle. I want you to step into the nearest aisle while people are praying. If you have a sense of being chosen and you know you've been out of place, you want to come back to the Lord today, I call you now. I call you now. I, call, I don't need you to clap. I don't need you to clap. Hold your clapping. I want you to come. I want you to come out of the balcony. I call you from the last row all the way in the back. Don't let where you're sit, seated intimidate you. God has something for you today. I want you to come right now. Right now, without reservation, come to this altar. I'm a backslider. I'm coming back to the Lord. I'm a prodigal son coming back to the Lord. I'm a wayward girl, but I've been chosen. I know I've been chosen. I just don't fit in the mess I'm in. I, I got to come. He's chosen me. His hand is on my life. I must come. Come right now.